time wearing like a Laura antenna and. Uh... Oh. <laughs> That's awesome. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Okay, give me a give me a give me a count. Let me see if I can stick. No, <laughs> no, 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 I'm joking. Sorry. Okay, ready? One, two, three, four. Hey, so how was that? Good. We need a better mix, though. We got to pipe that right into the mic. Oh, I know. I know. Next week. Next week. Yeah, you and I are going to work when we work on our uh, our our I'm intro. Not- yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> and, oh, I, I, I want to tell you something. They have cowbell in that song. There's a little bit. <laughs> no, that's no. not me. I'm playing bass. No, no. There's a lot because they they have two cowbells yeah. tuned. It. Yep. So you know in the in, right in the first measure. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And you Second. know how you pick the song. <laughs> All right. Mark, this is your week, man. Kick us yeah, off. my week. <laughs> Thank you. Kick us well, off. actually, this is one of the yeah my favorite topics that actually I I learn by doing. No, I'm not an expert on that. Um, so it's it's about uh, business models on IoT. So um, actually, when I when I when I'm giving classes in the university, the UPC, the University Polytechnic in Catalonia, mm-hmm. um, and I always start asking the students. Uh, maybe I, and this is, will be a spoiler for future students, but anyway. Uh, so I asked them a definition on, of the IoT. So how do you define IoT? And all of them all, all explain, start explaining now communication between devices. Yeah, all, you, can, you, can, you can imagine you know, all type of, of answers like that. Very technical. Mm. So next slide is like, no, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, IoT is about making money. It's about making money or helping companies. So it's about helping companies to make money or helping companies to save money. Right. So if you don't, if you as an engineer cannot make that happen, it's not gonna. The project it's not gonna happen, right? And and we see these on B two B and B two C. Well, at least from my experience, so B two B, so B two B business models on IoT are are pretty. Yeah. So I have seen a lot of innovation on that. I have seen from the razor blade uh, business model, no, with this uh, freemium, or uh, yeah, or I don't know. Um, th- yeah, there are a lot of uh, different business models on the B two B, and as well on the B two C. So on the B two C as well, I have seen some some innovations there as well. So yeah, I wanted to open this IoT coffee talk uh, with yeah, what are your experiences on 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 business models? How so business models has been a stopper for you on an IoT project. And, and yeah, how do you think, yeah, at least my experience, it's that uh, some companies are blocking uh, like innovations of business models, but how do you see this in the future and more like this post COVID-19 situation? All yours. Well, I wonder if, I wonder if the whole saving money is going to become even more powerful because right. We don't have the budgets that we used to. We don't have the revenue that we used to. We don't have maybe even the staff or the people in-house, you know, people are staying at home. So I wonder if that becomes even more of a a message or a theme moving forward to really help scale. Um, Yeah, I saw a presentation topic the other day, and the title, I think, was something like, uh, I'll paraphrase it, Innovation in a Zero Capital Environment. And it's, it's kind of an interesting thought, right? Get more from what you have. The IoT continuum, if you think about it, uh, started off with, I use the mousetrap analogy sometimes. It was like, just uh, be able to update your mousetrap and make sure it's running okay. But a lot of people still do the basic kind of device management, software update. That's kind of, but to Mark's point, it's, in, it's interesting. A lot of people have talked about these transformative business models. And seemingly very few have actually implemented them. I mean, particularly the, the um, you know power by the hour whatever as a service it's a great idea but I still haven't seen you know in a big way people implemented that if you have any anecdotes I'd love to hear them I have an anecdote 
Okay. And you're That's right. Uh, yes, I'll give you, I'll give you one. Um, <laughs> and I've, and it's way overused on my part. So I apologize in advance. Um, so when I was at Hitachi, um, Hitachi, you know, big industrial conglomerate. And so one of the things they make is uh, bullet trains. Mm. If you go to Japan and Asia, you'll see them all over the place. But where you don't typically see them is in Europe. You know, you see Alstom and, you know, Siemens, ICE, and all, all those kind of trains there. So when I was there and we were building this Lumata industrial platform and our analytics, and um, we, there was a, an RFP basically put out, like lots of things in life, right? And so the, the UK <laughs> government put, you know, all their intercity trains were ancient, just really old, you know, really coming apart. And they needed to replace all of them. And so they put out, you know, hey, we put out bids, whatever. And so um, all the usual suspects in Europe showed up to the party. You know, it's going to cost this, you know, you can imagine how expensive that is to replace trains for a whole country. Uh, so with Hitachi, though, we took a risk. We had a belief. You have to have really deep knowledge of your hardware, in this case, a bullet train. Um, we had like 40,000 sensors, I think, per train. Um, you had to believe in this IoT and analytics, and we had all these R&D folks from all around the world working on building uh, different machine learning models. You don't need machine learning for a lot of the things, but other things you do, it didn't matter. Um, and so we took a bet, and so we had Lumata running on a train, connected to the train management system, getting in telemetry from these 40,000 sensors, making sense of it, I think we use Vodafone and LTE for when the train's going, um, you know, for things that are maybe critical. Like you might just do KPIs as things are moving. If it hits a certain threshold, I need to use LTE to do something. Otherwise, maybe I can wait till I'm in the train station uh, to have Wi-Fi or whatever. Um, anyway, long story short is that we, we got the business because we said we're going to do trains as a service. And we're going to do it based on outcomes, you know, trips completed, miles traveled, whatever. Um, and there was going to be no upfront cost to the UK government, which obviously helped a lot. Uh, back to Stephanie's point, nobody has any money. Uh, and actually, people have been strapped for cash for a long time now. Uh, this is and it's just a lot worse. Right. And so you can imagine a whole government saying, okay, I'm going to have to pay tens of billions of euros or pounds or whatever to buy these trains and these guys. But Hitachi says, I don't have to pay anything up front and I'm just going to pay like a SAS model. Mm -hmm. uh, that sounds great. And then you guys have to do the maintenance and everything and, and there's SLAs and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to go. And so we won the business uh, because it made, we made it by following that business model. We made it easier for the customer to acquire the product or the service they wanted. Um, and it, it worked out for everybody. Now, obviously, it's a big risk on the part of the OEM, the Hitachi, and you have to really, you know, you're betting everything on, on your, te your, your technology. Um, another thing is, while it's easy to casually say casually. You, should, you should do this, keep in mind, you have to be a giant company that can afford to upfront build the trains on your dime uh, and deliver them. And so, uh, not everybody can do that. It just depends on what the hardware happens to be, I suppose. Uh, but anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a use case that, that it actually worked out and it, and it paid off. And it's yeah. interesting that you, I was going to mention that cause that model sort of blocks out small innovators in a way, it's not a bad thing. It's, a re, it's just a reality. Even if you, if you think about the shift from, um, not just hardware SAS or, you know, ass, 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 uh, but if you get, if you think about uh, the shift to software, um, companies used to get perpetual licenses up front. It's it, it's changed the financing model for so many uh, startups too. You need a lot more money, right? Because you're amortizing your R and D, you're amortizing your sales. You just don't get that up front, and this takes it kind of what you guys did took it to like a big extreme, right? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Billions of capital. We really but, stuck our neck but, out there. <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, models like these, I have seen that are stoppers on some companies. So let me give you an example. Um, so governments, for example, no, they change uh, no, political parties every four years sometimes. No? So 
So they cut, so they have budgets for that amount of time or something like that, or even, even, yeah, it's dangerous because maybe if it, so if it's right party and then it will change to left party, at least here in Barcelona and Spain, they just change everything that the other party introduced, no? So it's, it's tricky. So I, what I have seen on companies, not on governments, I didn't have this experience on governments, on models like the one that you mentioned, is that they say, I have the budget now. I don't want to pay an OPEX. So I don't want to pay like uh, every month by month. I, I have the budget now. I prefer to pay this now or every year, once per year, because I will have this budget every year. But but not as a not as a so for example not not as a pay per use business model. I don't want to. I want I, I want a one year shot one one shot payment per year something like that for a flat rate business. So this is uh, yeah some of the business models no that yeah. I have see, that I have tried and has has been hard for me to find like the right solution maybe that that was a right a good solution but uh, i don't know what was the return of investment if you can explain on years of that project for uh, hitachi it's, it's still pretty early we're probably only like two years into it now um it was cool to see a hitachi train in the uk with sir richard branson uh yeah. with virgin trains on it and everything like that um you know in the end Back to what you said at the very beginning, Mark, this is about business and making money or saving money. And so all the discussion aside, we were there to win the business and we did that and we won the business. <laughs> uh, will, you, will you comment on how early in the process where the risk management commercial side of the house aligned to this? Because I think we all, we all get the the background in industry that Hitachi has, so you know the knowledge about the house. Like, of course, it's Hitachi. Of course, they know. Uh, but you know, how early were the again commercial um, risk guys brought in into this? Because that had to be part of the equation. Yeah. No. I, I mean, gosh. I, I joined in 2016, and it, that 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 process, the business side of the process that that you had been underway, I think, for probably at least a year or two, maybe more, uh, before we actually really got down to making it happen. Um, but, but you're right, you know. You know, we talk about, you know, you think of one of those scenarios in IoT, the remaining useful life deal, trying to extend that, you know, because there's this notion, if I just stick with trains, in order to make sure the trains are super reliable and they're, they're the thing is, you know, the quality has actually gotten really good over the years. Um, you know, this whole notion that you're going to fix things before they fail, you're finding that really high quality equipment doesn't fail like you think it does. Um, but also, there's a scenario where the train is almost getting completely rebuilt over the course of so many years to ensure that uptime. Um, but of course, that costs a lot of money for the OEM the maker of whatever the product happens to be. And so you're, if you can use sensors to avoid having to do that or only do what you need, you know, that's a good, it's a good thing. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting scenario, you know, obviously, obviously we, you know, I, I guess GE had done that with their aircraft engines, you know, right. kind of charging as a service. Cause uh, you know, my experience here living in the Seattle area with Boeing plants all around us, People buy the plane, but they buy the engines separately, you know, mm -hmm. Rolls Royce or GE or whatever, you know. And so uh, it, it's, it's an interesting deal. It's, a, you know, these hugely expensive purchases, you know, how can you make it easier for the customer to acquire your product? Is a car lease much different, right? You're kind of like, in, in a way, it was kind of always yeah. the, um, the, the challenge is, is like, I, that's a great point you brought up, David, is it's a, you have to be very data informed to come up with a proposal like Hitachi put forth, right? They're holding a massive amount of economic risk uh, in that, but they had the data experience to back it up. Yeah, you know. Oh, I was going to say, too, that, you know, we talked about saving money and making money, but I think the other one is, in terms of business models is sometimes we're forced into it because of compliance. Take, for example, electronic logging, or take, for example, when Walmart was requiring all of their suppliers to comply with RFID um, tagging on their, you know, the supply chain. So that is kind of the other scenario that creeps in in certain industries is there's a new 
regulation or compliance or standard for transportation or asset management or whatever that forces companies to have to reconfigure, you know, invest in technology. So that's kind of the other piece of that. Uh, anybody have any other good examples where the industry had to shift or invest in sensor or IoT technology due to compliance? Do, do you, I mean, certainly in the post 9-11 world, a lot of municipalities um, driven by you know, Homeland Security, I'm sure this was a global thing, but uh, you look at the, the security cameras, sensors throughout the cities for, you know, for safety infrastructure, that's not making money or saving money per se, right? I mean, I guess it's making someone money. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't know if that's compliance, but sort of necessary infrastructure that doesn't have a, a clear ROI. Yeah. You know, I'm totally familiar with that, actually, uh, in the oil and gas business. You know, I grew up in Houston and worked at companies there and absolutely is familiar. Had friends, you know, working at uh, companies. I don't think they knew they were doing IoT, but they were doing compliance monitoring because refineries, chemical plants, all these things have a pages and pages of compliance regulations they have to stick to. And so they're monitoring emissions and all, you know, those places can blow up, right, as we've seen on TV. And so it's in trying to stay in compliance is a huge deal for those companies and it costs them big money and fines when they're out of compliance or worse, you know, people can be injured or killed in explosions. And so I've seen companies that they kind of evolved, I'd say over time, where compliance was, as I always joke about, you know, you're competing with a guy with a clipboard. Compliance was with someone in a clipboard walking around the plant, making sure everything was okay and in compliance and taking measurements and then slowly evolving, not always, <laughs> some of them, to remotely monitoring, right? Uh, digitally, wirelessly, whatever. Um, but yeah, that's that's a thing. There's okay. a lot, it's kind of a hidden thing too that we don't talk about very much is, is government compliance with, with regulations. It's a, it's a powerful thing for well, IoT. Well, and, and I think, you know, so in the context of the companies that sell an IoT something, widget, solution, whatever, it's funny that if it's regulatory, if it's legal, if it's compliance, like that is such a clear driver because now it's like, oh, wait, if we don't do it this way, we cannot transact. And I wish more companies took that approach and I'm going to quote a previous episode and Stephanie saying, you know, centricity, centricity of the, not citizen in this case, but a customer. And it will be great if the approach of how does this customer want to pay for what I have to offer? And just ask that question because there's, you know, it's a CapEx, it's an OPEX, it's in the middle, who's taking the risk. Um, but so in the context of business models, uh, you know, it'll be um, the, the flexibility seems to be coming from the, from the smaller shops um, because they want to be innovative, they want to be disruptive, and then goes all the way to the Hitachis, which are worth, you know, billions of dollars in market cap. So, but those in the middle are stuck with, no, this is how we do it. Uh, it's CapEx and I don't know anything else. Or it's OPEX and I don't know anything else. And it, it, it kind of, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big gap there. I'm wondering too if because we are, you know, we're shifting, we're very focused on um, safety and um, our health. If things like natural language processing and Henry and voice automation and all of those things, because I've already seen some news stories too around like, say you get in an elevator, we don't want to touch those buttons anymore, right? So there are already companies that are looking at all of the things that we do throughout our day that we're starting to get very uncomfortable with as we start to ease back into some of our normal routines. And so there are companies that are looking at all of those things and going, okay, how do we create a business model or how do we create a new way of doing this um, without having to touch or without having to put our lives at risk or without having to go wash our hands or, you know, um, using antibacterial um, soap or whatever right after we do something. So I'm wondering if we start to see some of these startups, they need to go after these little niche areas and, and push out a solution. But I'm seeing some examples already that are starting to think through the way we do, the way we do things. This might change and that might open up some doors. 
I, I read about an outfit retrofitting uh, esca, uh, escalators, and they're putting, uh, I don't know, some sort of a container that has the germ killing solution. So as it goes under, it's basically wiping it and keeping it clean and germ free. And it was something like 10,000 a pop. The addressable market is, I mean, there's a lot of escalators in the world. And again, did not exist before COVID. And I was like, you need this because who wants, you, you want to hold on to the handrail for safety. You have, you know, mobility issues, but then you might not necessarily want to touch it because of its gross. It's Same physical. thing with the uh, the HVAC systems where when the, when the, um, you know, they already, you know, the lights go down in the evening, we're all out of the building and all of a sudden you're emitting um, UV um, light across the, um, you know, it's through the HVAC system and then it's now supposedly cleaning um, the environment that the office is in. So the next morning when you go in, you know, you're supposedly so many, 99 point, who knows how many percent, so it's to be bacteria free because of this new, you know, so now HVAC companies are looking at ways they can leverage this new technology as a service um, to, you know, run these systems while the um, employees are out of the office. Here's an interesting question. I'm going to take a little contrarian view, not contrarian. Um, this is a good example where there's, there's advantages to those systems being connected. Say, say, for example, that escalator washer but they don't need to be, right? So sometimes we, we conflate um, sensing, automation, and control with IoT, but I would make the argument it is. It's the intranets of things, right? It just doesn't happen to go out to the cloud on the internet. I guess the point here is we've got this bag of technologies that, that are available to us, sensing, control, machine learning, whatever, um, and they don't always need to be applied in this connected way. But I guess that uh, I wanna maybe start the question with, those are, those are um, all very powerful and valuable things. What would that connectedness of the IoT add to them, right? In the, um, is it? I, so I would say, right, bare bones, bare bones. I want, in my, if, if I'm the shop installing the, the washing liquid, that's it. I'm not, I'm not Otis, I'm not Schneider, I'm not the escalator guy. At a very minimum, I would want to know the volume of liquid in this thing. That's it, nothing else. Yeah. And, and report by exception. I don't need to know that it's half full. I need to know that it's almost empty. That, that's it. And, and if I can grab that data point, maybe I'm fancy and I've got this patch and I can organize it. Or maybe it's the clipboard. Maybe it's good old Excel. But that would be the one data point. Give me volume because I'm assuming that I am reselling the service of visiting the escalator to refill the solution. Yep. Uh -huh. I mean, since we're talking business and business models here, and the outcome is I want clean escalator handrails or I want that kind of stuff, business is business and IoT may not make sense. If it costs less money to have a person run around all your escalators in the shopping mall that night and clean it, then I'm going to do that instead and not use right. IoT or yeah. any technology. Yeah. And so, no, escalators, they are always going to the same speed. So you can understand that the, the day 35, you will need to to put more water and soap, right? It's not like something that it's dynamic and changes speed, etc. So, I mean, the, the mathematics there can play a lot. Let me give you another, uh, so another business model that for me has been the most innovative that I have listened so far on the IoT. Let me know what you think. Um, so th th there is an IoT um, a platform that actually was selling uh, projects for industrial uh, companies. And the most interesting thing is they, they were selling, um, probably I, I'm, I'm not, I don't, it's not 100% real what I'm going to explain, but it, it goes towards that direction. So what they were saying is, okay, we are going to install this in your industry. If it doesn't give the return of investment that we promise on this PowerPoint, you can pay this insurance and the insurance will pay you the project. Okay. What do you think? <laughs> Probably, Munich, yeah. everyone, Munich everyone Re, knows. Wasn't remember it? Munich Re bought an IoT company. Exactly, and this is how the yeah, this is how the insurance <laughs> company purchased the IoT platform. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Rob, you and I were at uh, IoT Solutions World Congress, and we went by we their. Talked to those guys. We're, yeah, we talked to them. Yeah, I thought that was very enlightening. To be honest with you, that conversation. 
uh, and, and I know I've probably talked about this before, you're right, using an insurance policy to guarantee the outcome because they feel confident. We've done this a bunch. We know if you do this, this, and this, you're going to get this outcome and save this money or whatever. Uh, but and it was you because know, but it's so hard to get business sometimes. It's so hard to get through that POC. And so if anything, it's again we're trying to make it easier for the customer to say yes. And so it's like, how about insurance will pay you off if this if I don't fulfill? Well, well oh, that sounds great. <laughs> yeah, but here here's the the ironic thing. Sometimes folks, your customer doesn't want transparency, right? So if you're, uh, let's say that you have auto insurance with the uh, uh, insurance company, you don't necessarily want them knowing all the stuff that you do with your car, right? right. And so the, the, sometimes the transparency that some of these outcome-based business models and solutions provide or offer are not things that the customer actually wants, and ironically, may also be things that the industry doesn't want. So if we think about the auto industry and, you know, telematics and this whole business of gathering all this information about your car and being able to do predictive maintenance and all this other stuff, you have to consider what the industry is at as a whole is thinking when a vast amount uh, or a very large amount of the revenues of the industry come from the service side and the parts side. Right, and so if you have these these um, products that are performing and lasting forever, well, you're you're going to compromise that legacy business, right? And so I think you start to run into the innovators' dilemma of whether or not you're going to really pursue these IoT solutions hard and then transform more into a, let's say an outcome-based business model, because I think that's what we're talking about in terms of the AS or AS type of business models and the transition that and is bringing about. By the way, that's the title for this episode now. Just for the, record. <laughs> the AS model. Yeah. And, and the subtext is how Leonard Lee single-handedly killed the industrial IoT marketplace. Right. Oh, no. <laughs> he re he no, revealed no. the elephant that's in the room that many of us know about is that big industrial companies make way more money on maintenance than they do selling the product. Oh, huh. And that whole predictive maintenance stuff that everybody thinks is so good, it's a business killer. It's yeah. a money killer. Yeah. The only thing that it really, <laughs> where you see the value proposition for the, the, uh, the company is really for uh, reducing the risk to the warranty side of the business. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, you, you, know, you, minimize cost. you don't want, you, you want to be, you want to make sure that your product gets past the finish line. Right. I think that there may be an exception. I know one of the, one of the projects I did for one of my customers was on um, the ground support equipment market in the aviation industry. And they, you know, their metrics, their financial metrics is based on on-time delivery of, you know, people. And so they're, they're, they are successful, only as successful as the time that they have those you know, successful flights. So the predictive maintenance part was like a massive driver for all of the maintenance that's going on the ground support equipment. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of all sets the stage before that flight takes off and when that flight arrives. So right. there are some exceptions to the rule. And again, though, that one's all based on very strict compliance regulations and very strict measurements on those on-time flights. So it, sometimes you have to go back to the industry and really dive into what are the metrics that the customers are expecting or what are the metrics that the industry is expecting and, of yeah. course, those shareholders, which – they come last, I say, you know, yeah. the customers come first. And, and, and I think it's important to understand. I think a lot of folks get like revenue model and business model and, um, you know, pricing model and go to market confused sometimes. Right. And, you know, the, if you were to sit there and look at it as a hierarchy, you have business model up on top, you have the revenue model, basically how you, the actual mechanisms by which you monetize that's basically a revenue model, right? And then, you know, when I was at Gartner, I, I used to get into these conversations all the time where I'm having a dialogue with a client who's talking about business model. Well, hey, let's do some, help us with, uh, you know, uh, figuring out what are some of those IoT business models. And oftentimes you get them starting to talk about, uh, you know, the monetization stuff. So I say, no, 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 that's really revenue model. So 
let's make sure that we have a taxonomy down here when we start to talk about business model. And, uh, you know, I think for a lot of IoT companies out there that want to, um, you know, uh, consider the different types of business model types, make sure that you get that right, those definitions right. And uh, also the angle because, um, you know, there's, there's a business model that a IOT service provider or equipment company is going or solutions company is going to put out there. And then there's things that uh, an enterprise is going to do internally in applying IOT technologies and solutions. And so, uh, you know, I think th that kind of um, understanding that separation and having clarity around that is really important. Um, so yeah. one, one area that I think is the, is wild West still, and it affects every one of us, um, is is the data as the monetization engine right mm -hmm. so if you think about it maybe on the consumer side people have just given up right I, I i accept that i don't own my data but if you think about monetization and and value creation models um there's so many indirect potential issues right uh, imagine a fleet management company that resells its data to the investment community who can get a really good gauge on, you might not be able to know that thing is carrying bulldozers, but with a little bit of AI, you can figure out what's moving where. And, you know, it's like using aerial imagery to, to sense retail activity. I guess the question is in this, if one of the kind of great unknowns is all the, the, the business model behind the data itself, I, I've spent a lot of time looking at this as a potential growth area. And I think it, we, we really do not have the governance in place and all the necessary stuff to have you know, complex data sharing networks. If in fact you buy into the whole data is the new oil, you know, uh, story. But anyway, I guess we'd love to throw that out there. Are there challenges if data is one of the monetizable elements of all these um, new business models? Yeah, just getting the customer to agree to let you have the data from the, I mean, in a business to business scenario. Uh, yeah, I would struggle with that all the time. It's like, yeah, I need the data from the hardware that I'm selling you because it's going to make it a better product for you and I'm going to be able to improve it and a bunch of other stuff. I may or may not resell that data, but even if I don't resell it, it's still tons of value. But you're right. When it comes to sign the contract, the customer might say, no, you don't get the data, you know. Um, it's, yeah. It's, it's yeah. Yeah, I think there's a business in aggregating data because, you know, especially for the large macro um, use cases, <clears throat> IoT use cases, it's literally impossible to get the breadth of data and the level, the quality of data to really um, be able to go to market with a lot of these aspirational IoT um, scenarios, whether it's autonomous vehicles, that are, you know, uh, um, you know, some of these things that are more in the public domain, if you will. Um, so that's one business, but their customers are going to really be the IoT solution folks. And I think one of the big problems with IoT is there, uh, that there is such the, a religion around data uh, when uh, you, you know, more, more of these companies really start, need to focus on the solution, right? So how do you apply the data that you have right now based on the quality of data that you're able to acquire for whatever it is that you're trying to do, but what, what the hell are you trying to do? And yeah. that, that's the question that a lot of companies that I talk to completely fail. Uh, so they just assume that gathering a lot of data, the data is going to be there. It's like, no, it's not going to be there. It's probably going to be crap. And you're not going to have all the data that you need. You're going to have to get it from someone else. So are you getting into the aggregator business? Are you going to try to make something happen? Or are you going to actually solution something? And so I think IoT solutions tend to be a lot more um, specific versus broad and world changing. And, uh, you know, when you see these uh, estimates for economic impact, uh, you kind of scratch your head wondering, well, where are these broader transformative, you know, globally transformative uh, applications or killer applications that uh, are going to make this stuff, these numbers happen? Well, On the data monetization side, I would say too that when thinking about, some of the feedback we got from cities was, is you might have the, the public safety department and you might have the waste department over here and all these different agencies and they have all this disparate data and they don't want to share. They don't want to open up their data to their, to their peers. 
So, and I think that this same thing happens in businesses and corporations today, the different departments that are managing data that's so powerful if you're looking at everything at a global level for that business or that entity or that enterprise or even that city, the, the individuals that are managing and running things don't want to share their data. So it's the same thing that some of the citizens have is we don't want to opt in. We don't want our privacy. Um, we don't want to lose control. It's the same things happen in corporations. They're like, this is my data. I'm not sharing this with this other group or department or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you have this internal struggle. Yeah. You know, if you're going to get to a data monetization around some core solution and you already have infighting and there's not acceptance across the board, then, you know, that's more of an operational challenge than it is, or, or entity challenge than it is. It has pretty much nothing to do with the monetization side. It's just no, that's, that's a great happens. point. That's a great point. And, and I think that's where this whole, when you look at these IoT business models, especially the ones that are quote unquote outcome based and, you know, the, the, similar to what uh, you described, Rob, it, it's really a significant organizational transformation and mindset shift that um, large companies, even, uh, you know, Hitachi have to make, right? It's still yet to be determined whether or not this move toward an outcome-based business is going to be a successful one for Hitachi. I mean, obviously with GE, they, uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to go here necessarily, but, you know, it's not necessarily the fact that, uh, you know, going to this outcome-based business model for their, their jet engine business uh, saved them over the last <laughs> decade, right? So, um, you know, I, I think that's the other thing that needs to be considered. Nice sneeze. Very, I, you know, <laughs> Leonard, I'm, a, I'm a, a disciple of Metcalf's law, right? The belief that the, the power of the network is directly you know, related to number of participants and so on. And if you buy into that, I, I'm going to even build on our discussion about data, and, and Stephanie triggered this thought in my mind. Um, the other thing is sharing data, and then there's business process integration across organizational boundaries. Both of those two things are the amplifier. I mean, we're not even tapping into the potential of what could be done better, more efficient, value creation. So I'm sharing data and process integration across value chain boundaries, and that's there's tr it's trust. There's so many kind of human and organizational issues, but if we get this balkanized approach that everything's just a standalone system, we're just leaving so much value on the table. I really feel that way. It's, uh, uh, you're, you're both right, and now that I'm defending uh, the status quo, uh, but it is, you know, pick a large corporation or, you know, let, let's stick to public safety and waste. Um, they're probably in different systems. So forget the people. So they're on different systems, different versions of truth. And it's really tough to prove out the business case to bring these two systems together in hopes of a bigger outcome. However, if we were to just flip it and there is this, I don't know, next week there's going to be a new ecosystem, uh, smart cities, and you know, take, take everyone. And from the start, they decide like, hey, we're going to use one system, we're going to trust each other, and we're going to share data. And well, today, we have a very specific use for the data. I'm going to use it for parking. You're going to use it for waste. We don't know what the future will bring, but we'll be ready. Uh, but that's not what's happening today, um, at least in, in large companies. Um, yeah. And that's before you get to the culture and people issue. But, you know, the business process, it's a pain in the butt. Yeah, you know, uh, going back to our smart cities conversation, I think, uh, you know, the more I think about it, uh, when we start to talk about, uh, you know, uh, application of IoT in, in public domains, uh, it, it really can't be about business model. It, it's really more about the, the model for public benefit. Uh, because you're, you're just not going to find that R ROI, or at least in the way that... Um, is going to be palatable for someone who's looking at things with a, a profit motive lens. And, uh, you know, from a business model perspective, I think that's why these, um, these uh, smart city uh, projects are so challenged. And we already talked about it in our previous, uh, uh, I think it was episode two or three. Um, but, you know, I think it's important to understand the difference and, um, you know, uh, 
bringing the whole business model conversation into the smart city conversation becomes uh, muddies the waters a bit. Well, okay. one, oh, sorry, go ahead, Rick. I'm sorry. Say, and, and, you know, if you take David's use case there, it actually ties with our last session on, on digital twins, right? Mm -hmm. The APIification of everything. Again, you have all these balkanized systems that were implemented over you know, many years, don't typically talk to each other. If we could solve the technical problem is we know how to deal with that, right? Yeah. I, would, I would argue that we kind of have that down. The, it's the people part, right? It's the people and trust part. There's no magic bullet for, I guess. Governance. Yeah. Have any, have any blockchain. of you blockchain. Blockchain, yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> oh, boy. Maybe. You know, have, any, this have any of you heard of a successful uh, risk sharing model where the model is, I think if you pull this IoT innovation, you're going to save X. So no upfront cost, no capex, no opex. But if you deploy it and it works like I say we are, we split the revenue. Now, I've, I've heard people talking about this. I haven't spoken to a human or a bot or a miner that has said it. So I'm wondering if you guys have heard success. We've done that in the past. Yeah. yeah. You know, free pilot. A lot of startups have done free pilots in that capacity. I guess that's sort of that model. Okay. Are you talking about like where you say, hey, if you use this new thing I made, it's going to save you. 30% on your whatever costs, and then we're going to split it. Yeah. Whatever. And so instead of me charging you a hundred grand or whatever for this, we're just going to figure out how much you saved. And then I'm going to take a cut of that. I've certainly tried to be involved in those kind of things. Very hopeful and naively. <laughs> <laughs> well, I heard a rumor about, and I don't know like where it went, but I can follow up. But I heard a rumor about, um, and it was in California and forgive me for what city it was in, but they were working on a proof of concept to essentially when FedEx, UPS and all of the drivers that are coming in and they're making their deliveries, but allowing those lights to go green when they come through and notice notifying that the, the, the uh, light, the traffic management system actually knows their FedEx, UPS, you know, there's some kind of communication method going there. But they're, they're saying the time to delivery and the cost savings, were in, they were able to look at fuel management. The whole driver was fuel management. And with that fuel management cost savings, that's what they were, that was the whole concept was, we're going to save X amount on fuel and we're going to split the cost, cost savings. And so we get a percentage of that that you're saving and you get this great, you know, percentage that you're saving on fuel. I don't know where that went, but that was like one of the um, – one of the only use cases that I've come across that was, you know, really driven around cost sharing based on savings, but I don't know where it went. I, exper I experienced that, but it was from, uh, from an, an owner of a business uh, buying a fleet solution. Uh, this, this particular shop they had, he knew that most of his fuel consumption was from idling. Uh, these guys would go on site and leave the truck running because say, I want the cabin cool 72. <laughs> and, you know, he bought an IoT solution for, you know, a half a dozen, you know, for a dozen trucks and just told the guys, look, uh, I think this is going to save money and I'm basically going to give you a percentage of this. And this crew literally sold dollars and that was the driver. But this was, again, an owner bought a solution and did the revenue share with his employees, not, mm. not the IoT uh whoever sold the deal. The, build, the HVAC space, the building automation space has definitely done a lot of this value sharing for a while because it's to back to kind of Rob's scenario, so much data, right? They knew the domain. They knew they could save the customer 10%. Yeah. So it was, it was just a, and, and there wasn't, there, there, they weren't dependent on the customer's behaviors and doing something, right? Because I don't know if that's what you encountered, Rob, but you make all these great assumptions about what the customer's commitment is going to be to these savings, and if it doesn't materialize, the vendor's on the hook, not the, not the customer. Uh, and those are all examples of resources, fuel, energy, right? So there might be a pattern there. <laughs> so, hey, guys, um, we're running on an hour. Woo! <laughs> <laughs>
we're having way too much fun. Because I don't want to stop, but we do because. Coffee. And you're the only one drinking coffee? Yeah. No. I'm yeah, I know. Okay. Oh, okay. There you go. Okay. And so one recommendation to the Zoom folks, uh, enhance your AI for this uh, live editing to factor in sneezes. David, that was a good one. Excellent sneeze. Good. Go ahead help myself. Yeah, and uh, before we close out, number one, I want to say uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, yep. And number two, Stephanie, congratulations on your 15 years. Last week, I know that you had an anniversary. So, so proud of I you. I made it. So happy mm -hmm. that you're part of our group. Yeah, exactly. And uh, Stephanie also was kind enough to secure a, a URL for us. So it is, uh, Stephanie, what is our URL? IOTCoffeeTalk.com. Wow. Awesome. You're official. Yeah. We are yeah. And if you're listening to this video cast, uh, you know, subscribe to our YouTube channel and um, we will be back next week and we'll have to continue this uh, business model conversation because it's so interesting. I think so. There's so many more to talk about. Yeah. Way fun. And so we will see you next week and I have no idea what we're going to talk about next week. Maybe edge computing. You never know. Yeah. Yeah. Something. We'll, we'll keep you posted. Just join our LinkedIn group. Uh, uh, it's IoT Talk. And uh, you'll see our live conversation where we try to figure out what we're going to be talking about the next week. <laughs> okay, guys. Hey, it was fun. Yeah, Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.